concerned about Tim. Welcome everybody. Great to have you here tonight. Uh, we had a, a great time uh, on the trip and look forward to uh, to the rest of it. We have uh, some fine words being spoken tonight, not necessarily mine. <laughs> and then, uh, well, you guys know the schedule, so we've got a lot of good things still in front of us. Uh, but I, I want to uh, you know, particularly commend you. you know, those of you who, well, all of you, I think, in this room, who have a real appreciation for history and, uh, and for, for the past. Uh, you know, you've, you've shown by, by what you've done, by, by coming, uh, that, that history is important. And, and it is so important uh, to remember Remembering frames who we are, who, who we were, what, and kind of frames the future as well, because certainly the past leads to the future. And you know your commitment, your interest, your knowledge are all very impressive. Um, we receive our, our our inspiration in many different ways, from our families, from from other people. Just you know, who knows what actually brings us to the point where we become devotees of history. You know, I'm lucky, I guess, from my standpoint, I do know. I, uh, as a little boy, I came out of Mass Church with my mother, and I saw the big monument in the cemetery to those who had been killed in the Dakota War of 1862. And uh, my mother starts telling me stories from when I'm barely a toddler about my family's involvement in the Dakota War. and telling me about the monuments there. So the, the interest comes from all kinds of different places, and at least I have a pretty good idea of, of how mine was instigated. Uh, I've been pleased to be uh, the, the co-chair of the Minnesota Civil War uh, Sesquicentennial Task Force, along with Secretary of State Mark Ritchie. Uh, Mark couldn't be here for this, but uh, Wanted me to make sure that he that I extended uh, his greetings to you and his appreciation as well. Uh, Mark might be involved in little things called recounts. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's got this other little job that he does. Uh, but I certainly appreciated uh, uh, my involvement uh, with you and with the various events that we have been doing at, at Randall. Uh, and well, I, I could start listing all the people in here and then we start cutting into our eating time. We don't want to do that. Uh, but a, a lot of people have done a lot of work to make the last few years very successful. Uh, we've gone to a lot of events. Uh, we have recognized the, uh, uh, the grave sites of, of many uh, Minnesota heroes. And I think all who struggled and fought to save our nation are heroes. And so we, we did that. Uh, we've had a lot of other events that we've gone to. We've tried to educate people about what happened in Minnesota and in our nation in those years, trying to keep the memories alive. And uh, we went to Gettysburg and commemorated uh, Minnesota's part in the battle there. I will have a brief aside, and a lot of you do know this story, but uh, you know, I am the last casualty of the first Minnesota at Gettysburg. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, we did a little ceremony at Bum Run Creek uh, where the, the first Minnesota uh, charged out into the Mississippians and as we are proud to say in Minnesota, save the battle and save the country. But uh, we marched out, some of us uh, in our reenactor uniforms, members of the first Minnesota reenactors and me and, and others. And, and we met the Mississippians coming to us, and we exchanged things, gifts this time, not gunfire. We exchanged gifts, then we marched back, and then on the bus ride home, I discovered that I had the best case of poison ivy that I've ever, <laughs> had, <laughs> ever had, and I oh, got it at Plum Run Creek. <laughs> so that's why I am the last uh, uh, casualty uh, at the Battle of Gettysburg in the first Minnesota. <laughs> But again, we've had a, a great few years observing, commemorating, remembering. It's important to keep doing that. And even when this is over, you know, let's, let's keep on with the spirit 
of what we've established. So thank you very much. And at this time, I get to tell you it's time to eat. So I think we'll uh, just go like this, you know, one, two, three, like that across the room. Okay? Sorry about that back there. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start here. Thank you. So this one, I a quick update. Um, in about three, four, or five minutes, uh, Daryl will come up and introduce our speaker for the evening. And you've already heard him yesterday, but uh, wrap up your meal and grab some dessert if you like, because in a few minutes we'll get started um, with Eric Jacobson uh, speaking with us after dinner. And then also uh, Bryce Stenzel has put together a slide presentation um, that will come after that discussion um, that I encourage you to all listen in on as well. You know, Bryce is going to be looking at really kind of that period between the fall of Atlanta and the Battle of Nashville and, and, and how Minnesotans and the Union Army kind of got where it was. So that will follow uh, Eric Jacobson's comments this evening. And encourage you all to stick around even after that and have discussions and conversations here in the dining room or out in front of the lobby. And this seems like a great Saturday night to, to you know, get together and, and share stories. So um, in a couple of minutes, we'll introduce our speaker. Welcome everyone. My name is Daryl Sanis. I'm a member of the Minnesota Civil War Commemoration Task Force. And before I introduce Eric tonight, I really need to thank him first. So on behalf of the task force and all the Minnesotans who traveled here to Tennessee, thank you very much for taking time out of your extremely busy schedule yesterday and today to spend time with us. We really appreciate that. And Eric was born in Minnesota. As a very young man, he moved to Arizona, was there for about 15 years, where he had a very successful business. He came to Tennessee in 2005, and he is currently the CEO and historian for the Battle of Franklin Trust, which maintains the Carter House and the Carter Plantation, and hopefully much more in the future. He has studied the Civil War for over 25 years and has authored, authored three books about, mostly about the Battle of Franklin. He has also been featured in many Civil War documentaries in recent years. Eric lives in Spring Hill, Tennessee with his wife Nancy who is here this evening and they have two daughters. Please join me in thanking and welcoming Eric Jacobson. Well, I think I look better, but I was wearing the same clothes at 6.30 this morning. So we had a long day. We had lots of people come out, about 5,000. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> lots of cars. Um, in fact, I was the parking police today. Everybody who drove by as they came through the gate was wondering why I was there. And I said, because they needed someone who was a complete militant. <laughs> and would not let any nonsense begin. So I was down there and then I had to do, uh, I had to lead some crowd control because I don't know if you've ever been to a large reenactment, but for some reason people think they should just hang around where these big guns are going to begin firing. So we had to push them back and then they sort of try to get closer and you have to keep pushing them back and then you eventually have to say, listen, you need to stay back there and then you get the police in. So it was a good day all the way around. <laughs> But the Confederates tried to uh, tried to win again at Franklin, and they lost once again. And they suffered heavy casualties once more as they pushed up toward the federal line. But it was actually it was a, it was a really good event. Um, from where I was, um, there were I, I I just got a couple of emails, and I'm sure there are going to be some incredible shots. Um, but, and it was a great day. Unfortunately, tomorrow looks like it's going to be a little rainy. But God Don came up here, and um, this.
this this has been this has been a very busy few weeks, but this last couple of days have really been very interesting for me. I had I don't know about all, but I had a great time yesterday with you at both the Carter House and Carton. And um, I hope you have uh, I hope you've been enjoying your trip to Tennessee. You're getting a little bit of everything, cold, um, warm, or rain. It might sleep, then it's going to snow. <laughs> if you stick around long enough, you will get to see Southerners driving when it's snowing. Oh, 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 Lord have mercy, it's quite an experience. I may not have lived in Minnesota for a long time, but I know how to drive on ice and snow, and anyone from this area really doesn't have any idea. So it's amusing and dangerous at the same time, so hopefully you get out of town before it all begins. So I, I someone asked me, what am I talking about tonight? I, I don't know. I think I'm just a little loopy after the last couple of days anyway, so, and usually I just wing this. I spoke yesterday, anyone at the state event yesterday morning? I know a few of you were. Someone asked me afterwards if I was speaking from notes. I said, speaking from notes? I would never do such a thing. That would ruin all the fun. Yeah. You've got to be able to improvise while you're doing this and just sort of talk, I think, if not off the cuff, at least from the heart. And so I was thinking about what I was going to talk about tonight, and I'm not sure how this is going to end, but I think we'll start with this. What you're doing tomorrow in a dedication to Top Shy's Hill is an incredible, incredible achievement. And, and I am, I suspect that most of you, maybe all of you, are cognizant of how important this is. But maybe not. Because I think sometimes things like this don't settle in for a few weeks, a few months, maybe a few years. Maybe it will take you coming back here a year or two or three years from now and seeing the monument again and realize what you were all part of. <coughs> because what you're doing is really something timeless. That monument will outlive all of us. That monument will be here not on the 50th anniversary of the battle, which I'll be there, I promise you. I'll be there on December 16th. But it'll be there on the 151st, and 175th, and the 200th. It is a timeless monument to these men. And earlier today, someone asked me a question about William Shaw. And they asked me about Shy being murdered top Shy's Hill. And I said, William Shy wasn't murdered. He was killed in combat. Well, the Yankees killed him. They murdered him. <laughs> and I said, well, I guess you can look at it that way, but considering Shy wasn't surrendering, and the desperate fighting that was going on that hill, he died in combat. And it got me to thinking later on about what happened on that hill. On that day, two weeks after the Battle of Franklin, the war had taken a dramatic turn. Because two weeks earlier, things hadn't quite been so clear. <clears throat> Franklin, Franklin was a major turn. But there was fighting yet to be done. The Confederate Army tenaciously hung on that first day of the It's amazing to me that those Southern troops actually held that first day as they were pounded on both flanks and pulled back that night. And they tightened up the position. The left flank anchored on Shy's Hill. And it was a bad position because they were digging in at night. The, the works weren't properly placed and it would lead to disaster the next day. But something else happened on that hill because it wasn't, as is so commonly known, not just in Tennessee. This is, this is another example. You heard me go on and on yesterday about how Franklin had nearly been forgotten. Well, there are many elements about Nashville that are, are frankly not really well known because if you go to Shots Hill, which is one of the best remaining parts of the Nashville battlefield where you can get a sense of terrain, space, and time, and 
particular series of episodes, you would think that that hill was all about the destruction of the Army of Tennessee. And in some ways it was. Let us not forget that the Army of Tennessee was shattered that day. What was left of it, what remained after Franklin and the first day of Nashville was shattered. John Bell Hood himself said that he had never seen an army dissolve on a field of battle as they raced for the cover of the Brentwood Hills, not far south. Thousands would surrender before they ever got to that line of hills, but it was much more than the destruction of the Army of Tennessee. The monument you're placing tomorrow, I would dare say, is not just a monument to Minnesota troops, although that's what it might say. It's a monument to something else. Yesterday, Jim Lighthizer at the state event, those of you who are there might have heard, he talked about how Virginia and Tennessee have led the way in the sesquicentennial movement. And I, and I agree with Jim. I know where he's coming from. Virginia and Tennessee have done yeoman's work, the sesquicentennial commissions. <coughs> but you know, there are a lot of other states I often wonder why they weren't involved. We were talking about the importance of the sesquicentennial right here at the table. There are other states, New York, for example. Why is it New York done? considering all the troops they had here. What about Pennsylvania and Ohio, Illinois, Indiana? And here's little Minnesota. <laughs> as far as little at the time of the war, population-wise, the number of troops are. Little Minnesota is coming down to a battlefield that was nearly lost. Already been to Gettysburg, but here you are, naturally. Dedicating a monument on this hill that really, until a few years ago, most people didn't visit it. Through the efforts of the Battle of National Preservation Society, there was a lot of work done on that hill, saving it, preserving it, making it accessible, putting up a U.S. flag, a federal flag, a Minnesota state flag, making it a place that people could visit. But this monument is something else. It is a monument to the Union. It is a monument to those who saved the Union. It is a monument to men who were not fighting for home or a piece of ground. William Shy was from Tennessee. Many of the men in the 20th Tennessee who were on that hill were fighting for their native soil. Everybody gets that, right? You know, you fight for home. What are these men from Minnesota? Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, fighting for this idea of union, what drives them? This abstract thing, you can't touch it really, <coughs> but you can feel it, something that you can believe in. They swept up that hill that afternoon in 35, 36, 37 degree weather as the rain started to turn to sleet. Many of them immigrants. Many of them who barely spoke English, fighting for their new country. Boy, isn't that a timeless story. How many people have served in the ranks of the United States Army? Let us not forget, that's what these men were. We often refer to them as Union troops and Federal troops. They were United States soldiers. And what a timeless story. Men from different places and different walks of life different backgrounds, all melted together into this machine called an army. And on December 16th, as a lot of Confederate soldiers were hanging on for dear life, these troops from Minnesota and these troops across <coughs> the various corps that composed the Army of the Cumberland, the Army of the Ohio, and various other detachments, attacked one last time and pushed up those slopes that it was said after the battle were covered in blue, covered in the bodies of men who had traveled thousands of miles, well, thousand miles, let's say. To some of those men, Tennessee was as almost as foreign a country as those who traveled to Germany and France decades later. They hadn't been really far from home. They were in a completely different place, fighting for something that they couldn't see. And by proxy, they also knew they were fighting for the extinction of slavery.
Everyone knew by 1864 that this had become a war for the Union and the extermination of the very thing that had caused the separation to begin with, although the men who fought on that hill, most of them didn't have a vested interest in slavery, but they all knew what it was by 1864. They all knew the stakes. Everyone did. Those men charged up that hill. I'm sure you won't do this tomorrow, but when you look down that hill, that's a 45 degree incline. Nothing like getting shot at while you're moving uphill. It takes a lot of courage to keep moving up those slopes. Because the easy thing is just get on the ground. Guys shooting downhill often shoot high. You want to hug the earth. You don't want to expose yourself. They keep pushing up the hill. And you know what happened when they got on top of that hill? A lot of Confederate soldiers up there weren't going to surrender. Guys like William Shy. Surrender wasn't an option. He'd been through Franklin. He'd been through everything. He was going to die at the hands of the enemy. He wasn't murdered. He was, he was killed in combat because he wouldn't give up. That's what happened. That's what happens in a war. Guys like William Shy go down. It takes, it takes certain troops, whether it's the 5th, the 7th, the 9th, or the 10th, to scale those heights and get up there and finish the job. That's what they did. It wasn't pretty. But they went home. They went home just like the Tennesseans who survived. They went home too. Home was a little closer for them. Since I was raised up in the far north, I know what that land is like. I know what the people are like. And a lot of those veterans, I think, enjoyed those quiet moments out in the country where you could farm. Nobody be shooting at you anymore. You go home and enjoy a country that stayed together. <coughs> Their new country, in some cases. Like the fellow I mentioned yesterday, Ed Peterson. He'd been in this country less than five years. His adopted home was secure. And they went home and they made Minnesota a bigger, more prosperous state. Watched the country grow. Even got some states to the west called North and South Dakota not long after the war. He kept expanding from there. So when you're up there in Warren and you think about what these men saw, often thought about a fellow like Ed Peterson who was on those hills. He lived until 1927. Think about the changes that man saw in his life. I don't think there's anyone in this room who's ever seen the changes that the men of this that time frame saw. Electricity. Automobiles, telephones, another war. Two more presidents assassinated after Abraham Lincoln. What they called early moving pictures, airplanes. The First World War. The list goes on and on. But they only got radio in the early 20s. About the only thing they missed were televisions. Well, on the internet. Debatable how good the internet's been for society, but that's another story. <laughs> Imagine the change they saw. But the one constant was that the Union was preserved. I believe that the sesquicentennial has been a rousing success because this didn't happen 50 years ago. The centennial of the Civil War was a different kind of event. It was more of a celebration of the military events. This has been a commemorative four-year period to reflect on the soldiers of both sides, to reflect on the racial issues, the inequalities, the differences, and the vast changes that were set in place by the war. You are erecting a monument to troops from a state. But what you are doing is placing a symbol to the Union, to the perpetual Union. The Union that would not be dissolved. The Union that some would say was preserved by force. Well, I guess it was because some tried to rip it apart by force. And there were men from far away who put on uniforms and traveled many miles and fought on many battlefields, predominantly in the South, to save that Union and free four million people and set us on a different path, a path that, although cluttered and sometimes scary and irritating and aggravating, as we talked about yesterday, is still a great path. They saved the Union. 
don't forget that when you're up there tomorrow. And if you think it's cold and it's raining and you're like, oh, I just I can't get off this hill, there were a lot of guys that day who probably wanted to get off that hill too. <laughs> so your little bit of suffering up there will be nothing like what happened there almost 150 years ago as they laid their lives on the line in the last days of that long war. Thank you very much. in which the largest number, Virginia is first, Tennessee is second. So I think it makes logical sense, but they, they, were, they were ahead of the curve. Sadly, the one thing about the sesquicentennial that I am a bit disappointed in is that there is no national sesquicentennial commission. And why the president did not choose to establish one is beyond me, because it was a great opportunity, but the, the states have done, some states have really done great work. Um, I've been involved, obviously, very closely with the one in Tennessee, and, and they've been fabulous. Um, so it's nice to see that better it was Virginia and Tennessee in the South and you know, Florida and Arkansas. I mean, it would have been nice if they were too, but it just wouldn't have had the same impact. You see, yeah, so. see what happens after dinner? There's a lot less questions. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't get away yesterday. <laughs> and Minnesota is one of the few states, as I understand, talking to David Blight and others, that the state of Minnesota, through the legacy funds that, that we help oversee or help in the past, actually has funding to do some of the things that we're doing. And that we use tax money to do that. That's yeah, so a rarity across other states. Other states have commissions, but oftentimes commissions yeah, Tennessee is, uh, I don't know how Virginia's been funded, but the uh, both governors, the previous governor and the current governor, as well as the state legislature has helped fund. Um, they've been very, they've been very proactive. Um, I, I wish a place like, I, I really can't believe Ohio did not have a, a bigger ground game um, than they did, because it's a shame. If you look at Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New York, you're looking at probably half of the of all Union soldiers, and they just they didn't. Franklin was a, a fellow named John Adams, and um, John Adams was married in 1854 at Fort Snelling. Mm -hmm. there. And so there was a there's a connection. Hmm. He spent, I believe, two years there. Huh. He was a career army guy. Served at about. I think, 10 different posts between 1847 and 1860, so he was on the move all the time. He met his future wife in Minnesota, who was from Wisconsin. She was serving there with her father, who was, a, I think, a post surgeon. Have you been in Fort Snelling? I have, but it's been many years, you know, obviously, since I lived there. We're eager to have you come back. It's a great place. It's, it's a very, those, those locations, those, well, it was the West, of course, at the time. Um, there, I, I love it. If you're going up to do a private interview, are you coming back down here? Uh, yeah. I don't know. I'm... No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I guess so. I wasn't planning on staying around all that long. I think I have to be back at work at about 6.30 in the morning. I had a question that I was going to ask you privately, but if I don't get to see you again, maybe I'll have to ask it now. 
<laughs> when we were at the Carter House yesterday and I asked you about Shai's casket and you said it was at the Carrington Plantation? Yeah, it's in the And then when we got over there, I forgot to ask again. Oh. Had I remembered, would we have been able to see it over there yesterday? Um, that is a special exhibit of which there's a admission charge. Oh. So, could have, yes, for $10. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say that I really appreciate the task force um, working hard and putting this trip together and to, to get you to come and be with us yesterday and tonight because for me, I didn't have to close my eyes to try and envision what you were telling me. You were able to show me just through your words of what it was like and I it's, it's been great. You're great. So thank you, thank you. And thank you to the task force. Well, I, I will. I don't, know that, I don't know that even Randall is aware of this. There was, I wasn't sure that I could do this. And then there was some talk uh, internally on our end that someone else might be able to lead the tour yesterday and do this. But he's from Iowa, and there was no way I would have <laughs> <laughs> So, Minnesota wins again. <laughs> so Eric, I had a question with the uh, direction of the preservation efforts, which seem to be accelerating in a lot of ways in, in the country. But yet, with uh, the response you talked about uh, with Ohio and different states like that, um, what do you envision if you looked into your crystal ball that the 200th anniversary of the Civil War might look like? I, I, think, it, I think it depends on where you're going to go. If you're going to go to one of the national parks, although Gettysburg will always be very different because it's, it's so bigger than life, the national parks will always be there as a sort of beacon of open space and um, allowing people to understand these great and epic battles. Although the national parks have had some evolution through the years, especially on an interpretive level, in, in, in embracing the slavery element of <coughs> the war story, I think that remains. What the visitation is, the National Park uh, Service already suffers in some ways from declining visitation. And I believe that they really could learn from what private institutions, um, and some state institutions, state-run institutions, are doing. And they don't have to be just Civil War related. If you look at Mount Vernon, Mount Vernon might not be the best example because it is George Washington, but Monticello or Montpelier, which are Jefferson and, and Madison's homes, you can look at presidential homes. And look at, the, they're all privately run. Um, and, and the Hermitage. And they're incredibly successful. Um, and I believe that they can take a, a, a page from the way, pro see ours is a 501c3, but I don't run it like a nonprofit. I, we run it like a business. It's just the profit just rolls back in. And I think you have to do that to make it vibrant and successful. But on an interpretive front, which is really what survival is, because you can probably make a boatload of cash and make it into something that isn't what it should be. From an interpretive standpoint, all of these sites need to get people to understand why any of this is important. And if they don't do that, 50 years from now, you will see, uh, I, I believe there'll be a natural decline, but there'll be a steeper decline. Um, and they have to get people engaged. And they have to get people engaged who aren't just white. Because the demographic of the country is changing, or white or black. Mm -hmm. Because the demographic of the country is changing, you have to be able to reach out to people. And they're never going to be the majority, but you have a, groups of population, and you have to get them to understand why it matters to them. Their family moved here in the 50s, 60s, 70s, or 80s, or they live in California or Oregon, they're like, I don't know what anything about the Civil War. 
get them to understand it. If they come to where you're at, get them engaged, or else it ends up, it, it, the Civil War will always be a very special event. But I think that there is a lot of work that some places are going to have to do to shed some of the old ways of thinking. Um, and some will, will die. There are some Civil War sites that are not protected by the government, that are privately run, that just will never change, and they won't make it. Um, and that's sad. But look at the, uh, well, I mean, the Lincoln Museum is another example. The private running, it's, it's great, it's fabulous. Um, so it's kind of a wide-ranging an wide answer, but I don't think there is one answer. I think there's a lot of work that has to be done. People need to know why any of this is important. I remember someone telling me a story once about, and granted, it's George Washington, but if you can get people to understand history on a personal level like the story I was told, and then get them to understand why any of it matters, there's your key. Because history's not boring. It's not. History's just something that happened to someone else. You just have to get group you're talking to understand how important it was to that person or group of people. Um, the story about Washington was one when they, this was, everybody knows, you know, crossing the Delaware, what a great story that is. This is after that, as they were trying to get away. And Washington is sitting on the side of, of the road on which the Continental troops are moving, and it's, there's, a, there's a ridge, and he's, he's off the side of the road, the back of the horse is kind of down the ridge, and Washington was a great horse, and it was cold and rainy. Turn him to sleep. The horse started to slip. And his aide said that he watched, he was the only person who saw it happen so suddenly, just like that. The horse started to turn its head to the right. And he said he watched his Washington without ever showing the slightest bit of nervousness. Put his hand on the left of the horse's bridle and took his right hand and turned the horse's head straight. And he said the physical power to be able to move a horse's head in the direction it did not want to go without alerting anyone was one of the most incredible things he ever saw. And he said at that moment I realized we were going to win the revolution. Because <laughs> it would not allow us to lose. And that is a story that every time I tell it, it doesn't matter who it is, people will think, wow, yeah, that's better than chopping down cherry trees. <laughs> <laughs> Which <Yeah>. never happened. <laughs> Tell him about something that really did happen, and that they, that he was real. Just like the men that you'll be commemorating via a monument were real, flesh and bone, young. But you know, some of them were in their mid thirties. Saw a guy come into Carter House yesterday. Never been to Franklin before. You know why he was here? It was in Nashville. Decided he was going to come down. Had no idea it was the 150th anniversary of the battle until he got here. And he just found out, this guy's like 45 years old, and just found out that his ancestor had died at Franklin. He was a 43-year-old draftee. He'd been drafted into service. He'd gotten into the Army three weeks before Franklin. That guy's hooked. Because he now understands it. And so he's been sitting around talking. But there'll have to be changes. There'll have to be changes to get people to understand why any of it's important all these years later. And it is still very important. So many of the issues are still there. <clears throat> Eric, what is your post high school education background? None. Never spent a day in college. You couldn't get me back into those prisons. <laughs> <laughs> I went back to work. I was married when I was 19, yeah, um, and self-taught, both in business and in history. Learned from a lot of people, but not in the classroom. So. I would have cracked up in college. <laughs> Imagine sitting there for years. Eric. I just want to say one thing on behalf of Nashville. You all visited Fort Negley today. And uh, Sidney McAllister and I are on the Friends of Fort Negley board, which is newly formed. And when I was growing up, and it just is exactly what you're saying about you got to remember this. When I was growing up, we never discussed Fort Negley. Why? It was the Union occupied Nashville. 
And so we never talked about it. It was this place over there, and it was falling apart, and that was okay. But what you're saying is, what we're trying to do now is bring it to the attention of Nashvilleians, which we, we have. It's sort of, you know, 20 years ago, we wouldn't have talked about it. Now it's thriving. But the point is, what you're saying is so true. If we don't preserve those things, then it's going to go away. And it could have gone away, and it didn't. So the good news is that it is being brought to the attention of Nashville, it's whatever we're trying to raise money to um, support the, the re, uh, the re uh, what, reconstruction. engineering, reconstruction really of it because it's really in, in dire need of reinforcement. So we've got the engineers in there and doing everything. But it is Repair. a true. It's mm -hmm. about four to five million dollars. Yeah, it's Repair. huge. Repair. Yeah. So it's a huge deal, but I think because it went into disrepair, now we're starting. But you see how valuable that is. I mean, that's a huge site that you all visited today. So the good news is that everybody is seeing that and, and hopefully in another 50 years it will be a thriving um, great place to, to We enjoy fun. you all coming down here to see all this. Stuff. Yes we do. I mean economically you, it's yeah. wonderful for us because you came down here 150 years ago and destroy everything. <laughs> <laughs> we enjoy having you come by and visit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way. <laughs> uh, How are you doing, Scott? I am a Minnesota. Uh, this is what I do. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, but yes, McAllister College. Yep. Sure enough. Yeah. Did it sound like his name? No, not really. It's a different spelling. I know. I'm sure he gets a lot of questions. One more? Yeah, I'd actually like to propose a toast from all of us in the Sultans. I want to make a point follow up on a point that was uh, alluded to earlier. When we started discussing this trip about a year ago, right after, uh, the, the, the concept became very clear that this was not going to be getting there. It was going to be extraordinarily difficult to get a true understanding of either Franklin or Nashville because the towns had consumed the battlefields. And I, I can tell you that at least I personally was very, very worried that this was going to be disappointing trip because of that, because it would be hard to visualize what had happened here, hard to visualize what had happened in Franklin. And I must say, I want to thank both uh, John and Eric mm -hmm. for bringing to life. Uh, clearly yesterday we experienced that. Clearly today, John, you did the same thing for us here. Uh, I actually would argue that it was harder here in Nashville. I mean, my goodness, you're, you're, we're, we're, you're on the, the battlefield was consumed by a shopping mall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to say thank you and propose a quick toast of water to <laughs> our, uh, our hosts uh, and our, uh, our eyes and our ears and our memories. Thank you very much. Both of you. Both of you. Thank you.